Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Ong. My name is actually not uh, Rob Harrison. Uh, my name is uh, Robinson Simonyi. Okay. Uh, my church members call me Pastor Robbie. So in Miri, uh, all the pastors in Miri also call me Pastor Robbie. Lah. That's my just simplified it instead of calling me Robinson. Yeah, okay. So uh, this is my <coughs> first time coming to Ipoh. Uh, this is my first time. Yeah. My wife, my wife passed this way way back in 1977 on the way on tour to Southern Thailand when she was still young. <laughs> so for me, the nearest, nearest time I've ever been close to Ipoh was in 1996 when I stopped in Tapa. 1996, after I was, I just finished or just still doing my seminary study in Singapore, I went to Cameron Highlands, stopped in Tapa because that time we already started the Orang Asli work in the Cameron Highlands. Uh, we got some workers that we sent uh, to start the Orang Asli work in, in Cameron Highlands in all this uh, Tanarata, Ringlet area. And that was 1990, we started 1994. By 1996, I think we started the six congregations, small congregations in the interior in the villages around Asli, uh, villages. Very, very, that time was very, very prime jungles. Uh, I remember going there even by motorbike, walking on foot uh, those days. Uh, so by 1996, we felt that uh, our church in Canada Hill really could not oversee the work. Uh, so we, I, met, I, came, I came here to meet with Dr. Chu from SIBKL. I said, look, you people oversee the work, but we will support it. And that's what we did. We let uh, SIB West Malaysia uh, oversee the work and we do, we support the workers. So we sent our key pastors there and, uh, and uh, I think some of you may know, some of you may know Pastor Myun, Myun Ahmad. Uh, you heard his name, probably he died during the COVID time. One of the, the key person that really let the ministry grow. And after him, we sent Pastor Stewart Wan Ajang, who will oversee the work. And by the time they, these two left, the, the, the ministry handed over to the other pastors. There were 14 established congregations there. We also support most of the Orang Asli pastors that came to study in our Bible school in, in Sarawak. Uh, our church support them. Uh, I think almost 20, 10 of them, they be supported, and we send them back here to, this, to the Orang Asli works here. So uh, now the work is growing, I think. We have actually handed it over to SIV West Malaysia. Yeah, praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah, so uh, I want to speak this morning on this subject, the the urgency of, of time, the urgency of times may be familiar to some of us. Uh, I, me and my wife just came back from the OCF uh, Victoria in Melbourne uh, alumni conference, and our theme that time was during the last two, two three days was uh, redeeming the time, redeeming the time. But today I want to share on this very familiar subject, the urgency of time. We cannot actually recover the time. We can actually uh, uh, recover or redeem the time that we have lost. None of us can recover or redeem the time that we lost because when time is gone, it's gone. But we actually now, once we understand this message, uh, make full use of the time that we have from now onwards to fulfill the purpose of God and to pursue, to pursue His will. That's what we ought to do, to really know how urgent the time is. We cannot redeem the time if you do not know the urgency of time that you are in. Amen. You must know how urgent the time is. Then we try to make full use of the time wisely for the glory of God until the last days of our life on earth. So I think this message is also important for all of us to be reminded of. Some of you may be aware of it, you heard of it, but it's good to be reminded of it. Okay, so let's turn to next slide. Uh, in Mark chapter 11, sorry, Mark chapter 13, it says there, Now Jesus said these words here in Mark 13, Now learn this parable. He says, learn this parable. Mark 13, huh? Learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and put forth leaves, he says, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, he says, assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So Jesus says now, he says, learn. Learn this parable from the fig tree. Learn this parable from the fig tree. What does fig tree, this fig tree represent when Jesus spoke of this fig tree? The fig tree, in a way, actually symbolizes Israel. Israel. In Hosea chapter 9, verse 10, 
It says that actually there in, in Hosea 9 verse 10, because, you know, scriptures interpret scriptures. Uh, Israel was like a fig tree. Fig, Israel was like a fig tree. So fig tree symbolized Israel. And it says the branch, when the branch becomes tender and puts forth leaves, he says, that means that the fig tree has come to life. The fig tree has come to life. Okay. So, and we know that uh, Israel, Israel actually came back to life as a nation. Amen. It was, Israel was born as a nation in 1948. Yeah, okay. So it says here, when you see, it says, uh, uh, when you see that this thing's happening, when the branches become tender, put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Summer is near in verse 28. Yeah? Summer is verse 23, verse 28. Summer is near. So what does summer represent? When these things have taken place, when Israel has been born as a nation, know that summer is near. Summer is a period of Extreme, it refers to a period of extreme difficulties, a period of persecutions and tribulation. So know that, it says, when this nation is born, Israel is born, know that summer is near, a period of extreme difficulties is near, a period of persecutions and tribulation. Know that it is near. And you know that uh, uh, there are three weeks in summer for the Jews, which is called the morning period. Three weeks in summer for the Jews is called the morning period, a period of mourning. And, you know, this was the period when actually the temples were destroyed, both in 19, 19, uh, sorry, in 58, 586 BC and in the year AD 70. You know, there are two times when Jerusalem was overrun by the enemies. First time was by the Babylon, that was in 586 BC, okay? And later on in the AD 70 by the Romans. So initially by the Babylonians, and later on by the Romans. All this actually took place in summer. So that period... In summertime, three weeks became the mourning period. So it was a time of extreme persecution, tribulation, and difficulties for the Jews. <clears throat> so what does it says? These things will take place. When these things take place, these things refer then to the birth of the nations, the nation Israel, and all the things. This thing it refers to all the things mentioned in Mark 13 or Matthew 24. And what are these things? Deceptions, famines, war, pestilences, earthquakes, natural disasters, lawlessness. So, when we see then, the, when we see the birth of the nation of Israel, firstly we know then that summer is near. And then when we see all these things taking place, we know that it is near. What is this near? The coming of the Lord Jesus is near. It's near at the door. Now, Israel has been born in 1948. Some of the things mentioned here are already happening in, our, in the world today. Okay? So, know now that it is near, right at the door. And then, next passage, next, next, next text. Next slide. Then it says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation, you by no means pass away till all these things take place. This generation, what generation? This generation, we by no means pass away. They will be there, but they will, be, they will not pass away till all these things take place. Which generation are we talking about? I believe it refers to the generation that witnessed the formation of Israel as a nation. The generation that witnessed the formation of Israel as a nation. Now, assuming that the earliest time that this generation will start because, because all other people, they were grouped, the people they were born before Israel was formed, they will die early, right? So the first, the first, the first, the start of this first generation will then be the day that Israel was born in, on, uh, the gen Israel was formed in 14 May 1948. So when these people were born, they saw Israel exist already, yeah? They saw the formation of Israel, they saw Israel exist. So the start of the generation then is in 14 May 1948, that will be the earliest. So, if this is a generation, then we are the generation. Amen. We are the generation that saw the formation of Israel. But it says that when this, this form, Israel is formed, know that summer is near. We are the generation. So, we will know that summer is near. Yeah? Now, look at the period of one generation. What did the Lord say in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3? And the Lord says, My spirit shall not always strive with man forever, for that he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be only 120 years. 120 years. And then in Psalm 90 verse 10, it says, The day of our years are 70 years. And if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet they boast is only labor and sorrow, for it soon cut off and fly away. So, generally, God says, Okay, Allah, because of sins, the way they live your life, I'll shorten your lifespan. Your life span be 17 years old. If by reason of strength that God chooses you, bless you, then you live 80 and beyond. Yeah? Amen? 
Some of us live beyond 80 already, 90. My father, my father lived at age 96. Actually, most of my ancestors actually live very old. I think because we are in the interior, we only eat the jungle vegetables. <laughs> Fresh air, you know. So, but you see, the maximum lifespan of people, God says only 120. Not many people in the world reach 120. Oh. Maximum lifespan, no, not many. But that's maximum lifespan of one generation is 120 years. Maximum. If God bless you, okay? So now, <clears throat> so you say, he says, now he says, when you see, so let's, uh, okay, let's, formation of Israel until now. From 1948 until this year, it will be 76 years, right? 76 years, yeah? But if you say that the maximum of one generation is 120 years, that means that this generation will end what year? Very simple mathematic or arithmetic. Only 2068, right? The year 2068 is the end of this generation that witnessed the formation of Israel. This degeneration, starting from the time when Israel was formed, this is the time to the period when this generation will end. It's only 2068. And this is the time, as it says here, when all these things will take place. But all these things will take place. That's why it says then, when you go, back, go to this passage now in Mark 13 again, it says in verse 29, when we see these things happening, know that it is near. That means Christ's return is near. Yeah. And again in verse 20, Verse 30, after all these things take place, this generation will pass away. That means 2068. Now we're not saying, okay, I'm not, I don't want to say that the Lord will return this year, you know, on 2068. I will not say that, all right. I'm not saying that, okay. I'm just saying that by looking at what is happening here, looking at these verses, huh, we know that we are living in a very urgent time. It, this indicates the urgency of time that we are in. Because actually we do not know when the Lord will return. Only God the Father will know. But looking at what the Lord is saying here, we are living in a very, very urgent time. Amen. It's a very urgent time. And Jesus reminds us very clearly. Next, next verse, he says, No one knows. He says, No one knows. He himself says, No one knows when I will return. Even he says, The Son doesn't know. He himself doesn't know. Only the Father knows. Only the Father knows. The next, next slide. Only the Father knows. That's why he himself said this. But, but of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And then in Mark 13, he says, But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son. Only the Father. Only the Father. No one really knows. But looking at what he says here, giving us a sign indication, we are living in a very, very urgent time. Very urgent time. So now we go to the next slide. Where Mark 31, 13 verse 31 says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words, the Lord says, but my words will by no means pass away. And one of the words of the Lord in Malachi chapter 4 verse 1 to 3, talks about the day of the Lord. You look what it says about the day of the Lord. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. They will leave them neither root nor branch. But then in verse 2 it says, But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like stole fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for there shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on that day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. This passage talks about, firstly, the day of the Lord. Verse 1 point to all the things that will take place, and then the wrath of God, the judgment of God that will come upon the wicked, under, upon the unrepentant. But then verse 2, it says, and then, let on, it says, to you fear my name. It says, the Lord's return will come to restore righteousness. He will come to restore righteousness. 
He says, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out. You'll be blessed. You shall trample the wicked. There shall be wishes, ashes under your feet. On that day, says the Lord, I will do this. Then in Psalm 119, I also said the same thing. We all know about Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible. 176 verses. It consisted, consists of eight, oh, sorry, 22 stanza. Each stanza is eight verses. It's the longest chapter, longest chapter in the Bible. And the one chapter in the whole Bible, they emphasize so much on the Word of God. Remind us again and again and again. Reflect, meditate, hold on to the Word of God, the law of God, the statue of God, the commandment of the Lord, again and again and again. Reminded us to hold fast to the Word of God. Emphasize fully from verse 1 to the end, until verse, until verse 176, emphasizing to us on the Word, the statue, the law of God. And this is what it says in verse 150. They draw near who follow after wickedness. After wickedness, it says, they are far from your law. But the next verse he says, but you are near. Look at the word near. You are near, O Lord. And all your commandments are truth. So the verse 150 actually points out, verse 150 points out to the evil and wickedness of the last days. They draw near who follow after wickedness. They are far from your law. This is what the world, one side of the world is going on right now. Those who are living in darkness, they are far from God's word. Yet he says, but you are near. He's near. Amen. You are near, O Lord. I know your commandments are truth. So the Lord's coming is near. The Lord's coming is near. So now look at uh, those things that are mentioned. There. Those things that are mentioned that would take place in Mark 13, in Mark 20, Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, verse 4 to 8. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. And all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then many false prophets will arise, will rise up and deceive many. So, what are these things that will come to, they will take place, they will come to pass? He says, there we can, he says you know, many will come, saying, Christ said, many will come, saying, I'm the Christ. They will come and say, I am the Christ, and they will deceive many. And then there will be wars and rumors of wars. The nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Then you have famines, pestilences, have you experienced earthquakes in various places? But all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Still many false teachers, false prophets will rise up. Many and will deceive many. Now I did a bit of check in the internet about uh, false Christ. And I found 14. I don't know, many of you can research some, you can find many. I found 14 who claim themselves to be Christ, Messiah, in the internet. These are the ones that I saw here. That I, this, uh, these are the, the list that I, know, I find. Okay. And firstly, there's one from Russia. His name is Sergei Antoli Vetich. Vich, Vicha, Antoli Vicha, Torop. Yeah. And then there's one from Peru. They call himself Ezekiel Atakusi. Notice all these names here, the first seven here. They all claim themselves. The other, they call themselves, you know, they, they are the re reincarnation of Christ. You know? Okay. And they, all they, they say that they have the Messiah spirit in them. Messiah spirit in them. This is all what they claim to be. Okay. But most, many of them are from U.S., but some are Russia, there, Peru. There, okay. And then this one that you are familiar with, number seven. How many of you know this number seven? Apollo Kiboloi. How many of you have heard of his name? Apollo Kiboloi. He is actually quite a well-known figure in Asia, in Asia. Yeah. And he's got one of the biggest followers in the world, 7.7 .7 million. He got about 5.5 .5 million in Philippines and about... Uh, uh, two million overseas. Even got his own group. Even in, in, in Miri, in, in Miri, is Rawak, he has his church. Yeah. So, 
this man called himself the appointed son of God. And he is the founder of the kingdom of Jesus Christ Church. If you go to Davao, you go to Davao, the Davao Airport, you look at the top of the hill, you turn to your, maybe you come out of the airport, you turn to maybe to your left side, top of the hill. There's a very big, huge mansion that's owned by him. Yeah? And he's, he's, he built a king, uh, the Garden of Eden in Philippines. But right now, uh, maybe for your info, uh, uh, he is on the run from the law because of child abuse and uh, human trafficking. And I just searched for him. I've been checking on him on the internet just recently. And now some of his key leaders and key members have been arrested for the same charge. All right, praise God, you know, that the law is after him. <coughs> but just for your info. <coughs> and there are many others. <coughs> this one, this, this Korean uh, person, Han Sang Hong, yeah? the founder of the Church of God. He, I think you heard of this mother of God cult. He believes in the mother of God, all right? The cult of mother of God. So there's a, a father God and then mother God. All right, so... So all, all this, okay? And then you have all the rest mentioned here. Yeah? You got one in Brisbane. I mean, my two sons are studying, are working in Brisbane, actually. But this guy is an uh, interesting fellow. You know, he's uh, he, uh, Alan John Miller. Uh, he started the Divine Truth Movement. He's uh, actually an uh, IT specialist. He's, and his, his partner, he called his partner Mary Magdalene. Yeah? Okay? So he's the, he's, the, he's the Christ. So his partner is Mary Magdalene. <coughs> and then you got the last one here, a very interesting fellow, David Scheller from England. Claimed to be Jesus Christ reincarnated. Uh, uh, he used to be an intelligent officer in the I M15 in England. M15 intelligent officer, and then now he, then suddenly now he, he changed himself to be a woman and called his name Dolores Kane. So those are these are just interesting people. They call themselves the Messiah. I'm just giving this as example of all of us. But there are many false uh, pro teachers and false prophets and false preachers that are coming the world, all over the world today. Yeah, so we've got to be very, very careful. So how do you recognize them? How do you recognize all these false teachers, false prophets and preachers? Uh, here I just give a bit of tips for all of us. Okay? Firstly, we must test the spirits. Test the spirit whether they are of God. It's very clear in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Yeah? Discern. We need to discern the spirit with truth. Because truth is in the word of God. Truth, truth is in the whole context of the word of God. The truth is there to protect us, discern it with truth. Okay? So, uh, do they have, do they have, uh, you know, do they have really Christ-like spirit in them, Christ-like nature? Yeah? Do they have, do they have genuine love and, and humility when they come to minister? Okay? Uh, in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 15 it says, But he is, who is spiritual judges all things. Judges all things. So we discern the Spirit with the, the Word of God, with the truth, and with the help of the Holy Spirit. And we discern their message. Check it against the Word of God, firstly. Secondly, do they confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? You know, by water and blood, and borne witness by the Holy Spirit. Do they do that? Yeah? Do they believe that Christ suffered? He came in the flesh from God. He suffered and He died. He was buried for three days. After three days, he rose from the dead. And now he's risen. And now he's seated with God in, a, uh, in, in, in heaven on, on the right hand of God. Do they believe the same Christ? Because if they don't, then there's a false Christ. Okay? Do they preach the whole context of God's word? Or just isolated verses to suit their gender and doctrine? So it's very important in, in, in the church. We, we preach, you know, textual messages. We preach, we preach contemporary messages. And so what, is, what is relevant for that time for people to hear. But some, you also must at time preach the whole book of the Word of God. So normally our church, we do like, you know, like my church, uh, we preach the whole book, the whole book, the whole book. And in between, we slot in topic or texture that is relevant. But we will preach the whole book, the whole book, the whole book. Yeah? The whole book, Revelations, Ecclesiastes, all these books, the, Old Testament, New Testament, you preach the whole book so that people hear the whole books. But we also preach textual or contemporary messages that are relevant at that particular time or topical top messages. So we need to balance all our the word of God. Okay? And then we look at the signs and manifestation in the ministry or so-called anointing that they say they carry. Are these from God or, or, or for spirit? Because sometimes, sometimes, if they manifest people, they are prayed for and they manifest, then you begin to ask, what are these manifestations for? Is it meant to bless? 
the, the people. If it doesn't bless the people for what? Then you be, begin the question, what kind of spirit is that? It's just to show that they have power in them. So we need to be also be very careful. I'm, I thank God that I have a few of my mem 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 members, leaders in my church that every now and then they check, they, ch they, uh, they check one another. They also talk to me, Pastor, I, I see this thing, this thing, and I say, I listen to them and I also begin to check because we are there to be accountable to one another. Amen. In the church, it's like that. You don't know everything. As a pastor, I don't know everything. And sometimes my leaders will tell me also. Then I will go and check. Yeah, I say it's true. I agree. I always, we work together. I listen to them. We must check one another because we don't know, know everything. But sometimes new speakers, they come in. Yeah? So take note of all this. And then accountability. We check with our key leaders in the church or with our denomination before we even get these things because that we do not know. If we know them because we, we have we, you know, they've been missing together with us because of uh, uh, our friends, they know them very, very well, a different story. Yeah? We check, but we check with all our fellow ministers about certain speakers. So we need to be very careful about who we uh, ask to let to speak in our church. Like, even you have to check me or not? <laughs> Can I just simply take me in? <laughs> Am I genuine or not? <laughs> yeah, okay. So I'm giving you tips. <clears throat> Because we need to protect the church. Amen. We must protect the church. Okay. So these are false pre preachers and speakers. We need to be careful of. Okay. So then, other thing that happened in the last days, now this thing that I just mentioned, all these things, this, all the earthquake that take place in the world today. So many. You know, do you know that you go to check in the net, huh? every year there are more than 1,000 earthquakes that happen throughout the world. Every year. Yeah. There are so many big ones that we know about in February, in March. In, uh, in Japan, and then the very recent one, they just took place just, uh, just uh, this, this month in, in North, just near North Sulawesi, this magnitude of 7.0 7 magnitude on a Richter scale. It's very big. Yeah. So earthquakes are coming, or taking place all over the world continuously. And then we have severe natural disasters. Keep on clicking, clicking the whole thing. All the severe natural disasters and extreme occurrences in the world. Keep on, just click, click, click. We can see all these things, volcanoes, icebergs, extreme weather, signs on the sky, severe flooding, landslides, severe drought, and severe insect invasions. All these things that we seldom really heard here of many years ago now, all these things are getting very common today. What is God telling us? Jesus is always saying, these things are here. You will see these things taking place. And then you see the severe invasions. Some of you have seen this internet. Even go invade uh, the Middle East. I, I don't want to mention names. The severe uh, insects that hit all the uh, Tanasuchi, all this uh, in the place of worship. All these severe things are taking place in the world today. And then you have these world events. Digital ID be given to us, made public already in July 2024. As I mentioned about you know this month. He said it's supposed to be made public this, this month, actually, but it was initiated in the year 2019 about digital ID that we're supposed to have, okay? And then the COVID pandemic that we have, you know, the coronavirus, COVID-19, and then it's supposed to be another plague, severe plague that will come next year. That was already prophesied. You know, didn't you, did you realize that before this virus comes in, they already know the names. Huh? Why, how come they know the names? That means they invent this thing, Correct? It's all been made up, manufactured. They already give the name, this virus, this is their name, their name, their name, so they know. And they all don't know this is the treatment we're going to give. It's all been planned. It's all been planned. And then you have the central bank digital currency. Now we're going cashless. Cashless, to my wife, when we go cashless, we, two of us, we better stay back in the Kampong. We cannot travel uh, because we cannot. Oh, we are very, uh, very poor in using all this thing now. Online thing, difficult to do transaction uh, unless you bring your children to travel with you. <laughs> so how, how, all of us here, I think, how many of you are 50 plus, 60 plus, 70 plus? Beyond 60, 60, 70 plus is much harder to do all this thing online. Correct? How to go cashless? <laughs> so all this thing is a big challenge for all of us. It's all leading up to one world government, controlling the whole world. This system, I think, is a system, a system, a group of people, they are very, very powerful, that are controlling, influencing government or the nation to do what they want to do. So you may have your own government, but they've been controlled by these people at the top there. Because that's what the Bible is telling us already. 
So where do we fit in? How do we stand? These are the questions that we need to really take note of the urgency, the time that we are in. That we as a Christian need to know where we stand in the Lord. It's very easy for us, like me and my wife. I tell you, hey, when this thing takes place, or we go back to the interior, we got our land deep in the jungle there, you know. We travel eight, eight hours drive to our place there. We got our land, in the, we're living in a long house. We already got our new billet there, our house in the interior. We just stay there, eat, eat from the soil, you know, plant vegetables, everything. No problem for us, the interior is very peaceful, it's very quiet, and you know, you just, just, the rivers are full of uh, crocodiles and then monkeys and surrounding us. All this, are, I mean, it's easy for us. But then you think about the children. Our children, we go through all this, right? So we have a challenge. We have a challenge to guide our people how to stand firm in this difficult time, the agency of time they were in, and those in the cities. <coughs> now we go to <coughs> the book of Revelation 13, verse 15 to 18. <coughs> it says here, but he, he, the false prophet, he says, was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should speak both, so should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So he here talking about the first prophet. The first prophet was given power to give breath to the image of the beast. The beast is the Antichrist, the image of the Antichrist in the temple in Jerusalem. So here the first prophet gave power to the beast, the image of the beast, the image of the Antichrist in the temple in Jerusalem. <coughs> That this image of the Antichrist or the beast then would, would, would speak and cause many. He would, he would cause this ima the image to speak. And then those who would not worship the image will be killed. So the false prophet and the Antichrist. The false prophet give power for the image of the beast to speak. And the people are to worship this image. Those who would not worship this image will be killed. Maybe we think that it doesn't apply to us because it's happening in Jerusalem. But in a way, we are so connected. He talks about the time that we are in. Then he, came, he said, he, he causes all. He's talking about here again, the first prophet. He causes both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads. So a mark on their right hand and then on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. I think we're familiar with this passage. So there's a mark on the hand or on the forehead. And here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it's the number of a man. His number is 666. So it's saying that we are supposed to have this number either on our hand or our forehead. I think we all know this, right? Yeah, the number is 666. If you don't have this mark, then you cannot buy and sell. You cannot do trading. You cannot buy stuff. You cannot do business. Now look at the number 66. Why number 66 is called man's number? Three times man, man, man. What does it tell us? It's saying that, see the enemy is saying to us that you don't need God, huh? You are in charge of your life, man, 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 right? It's number of man. It's telling us you do not need God in your life. That's the number of the beast. Number of the Antichrist. Telling us, hey, you don't need God. You are God to yourself. Actually, he's asking us to honor and glorify himself, the enemy, the devil. There's a number that's giving to us. And if you don't have the number, the mark under your hand or your forehead, you cannot buy or sell, you cannot do business. You can see the photo there. So where do we stand? For me, the Christians, we should not be getting this mark. Amen. We should not. We should tell our children. So how will our children handle this? And this is a challenge for us. How, well, how will our ch children and grandchildren handle this when it comes? There's something that you and I must work out. We must work out. Because we are not supposed to have this mark either in our hands or our forehead. We need to be on guard against this. Where do we stand? How do we handle ourselves? But the Lord said, do not have this mark on your body, on your head or your hands. Yeah, okay. So, we are seeing the events of the last days unfolding before our eyes. That the end of the age or the end of or the Christ coming is near. And the Lord's exhortation and reminder to us is, you know, in Matthew 24, he said this. Watch therefore, you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. You do not know. 
So we have to watch so that we know what is going on in the light of God's word. And the light of God's timeline for us is mentioned in Mark, uh, Mark 13 and, and, and Matthew 20, uh, 24. And we are told to be ready. In verse 44. Therefore you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So we have to be ready so that we are not caught by surprise and unprepared. Like the foolish virgins in Matthew 20. 25. Watch. Be ready. So that we know what's going on in the light of God's word and God's timeline. Do not be unprepared like the foolish virgins. Their lamb is not burning. The fire in their hearts is no more there. Their life is spiritually dried up. There's no real relationship with God, no intimacy. When that time comes and Jesus returns, then you are gone. Mark 13, 33, 32, 33. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, nor the Father. But then he says, take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. So three things mentioned here by the Lord Jesus. The Lord's instruction to us usually is very simple. The Lord Jesus never gives us complicated instruction, you know. It's very simple. But sometimes to do it is a challenge for all of us, right? It's just telling us very basic things about how to live our, our life as God's people. So it says, take heed. Take heed. Firstly, take heed. I mean, pay attention. Take heed. Pay attention to God's word. Pay attention. We must obey. And then it says, we must have the urgency. Urgency of the time that we're in. Firstly, the urgency of the mission. Urgency of the mission. Our mission to reach. What's our mission, you and I? Our mission is actually to reach the people of the world with the gospel. The mission that God has called you to do. Okay? You know, all of us have a different calling. Not all of us have the same calling. But I think every child of God has a calling. You are not saved just to be saved, you know. You are saved for a purpose. And God has a purpose, has a calling for each one of us. We walk different paths in our ministry. And along the way, God will come in and step into your life and saying, this is the way that you want, I want you to do, to follow, to, to, follow, to walk, walk in it. So wherever you are right now, what is the calling that God has for you? You must have the agency or mission that the God has for you to do in this world for your lifetime until you depart from this world. So the agency or the mission. Then the agency or the message. By the message here, I'm not just talking about preaching the gospel. I'm talking about preaching the whole context of the word of God. It's not just the gospel alone but to really build one another in the whole body of Christ and the Word of God. Yeah? So, but the urgency of the gospel is important. But then we must bring in the full context of the Word of God, the urgency of our message, and also to warn people of the world. And then the urgency of the ministry, serve faithfully wherever we are. Serve faithfully. Okay? You are, all of us have different calling that God has for us. So we must fulfill our calling until the end. Secondly, be watchful. Be watchful. As I said just now, so that we know what's going on in the light of God's word and God's timeline. As we see things happening, then we begin to check against God's word. Make us more, have more sense of urgency that we are ready and not caught by surprise. And then of course, prayer. Prayer we all know. I think, we all, I think all of you must be part of the prayer network, which is a good thing. Be faithful in praying. And Jesus says, it's not written, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So actually our home is actually, a, our home is actually should be a house of prayer. Amen. Surely all of us now, we build our home to be a house of prayer. The prayer altars are raised up there, you know. Your own personal prayer and then your family prayer altar must rise up every day unto the Lord. Your house will be a house of prayer. Okay. So they got this, this is our, this would be a, a family altar, a personal prayer altar, a corporate prayer altar, of course, you know, uh, sometimes a, a covenant, covenant prayer altars in small groups, which is also very, very important. Yeah? If you have a small group of people praying with you, it's very, very needful. Yeah? I thank God that the last few years, several years, I've, I have a small group of people that pray with me every Friday morning. But I also have several prayer altars throughout the, the week. 
from Monday until Saturday. People are praying. I'd like to see bigger people, but we do what we have, you know. We must be faithful in praying. And then, of course, the city and regional national prayer altars that we must be a part of. I think because of our prayer, God has preserved our nation, Malaysia. Amen. It could have gone a lot worse. It could have gone a lot worse, but we restrained it. <coughs> we restrained it by prayer. I, uh, you know, when I first uh, <coughs> came to, back from uh, my study in, uh, uh, from overseas, come back to Sarawak, that time our, the Christian population in, in, in Sarawak was only about 34%, 34 to 35 to 6%, like that. I thought there's going to be a real tough time for us in Sarawak. Big, be big struggle because what is happening, you know, things are rising up against Christianity. Interestingly, we found a statistic this year. Uh, the percentage of Christians in Sarawak now is about almost 51%. You see, the only state where the number is increasing percentage, all the other states are actually going down. And I was looking at the chat. I happened to be in the chat whereby in this chat is all these former graduates of those people who study in, in Victoria, in Melbourne, uh, where I was studied before. And uh, all these people, so they put me in, and I'm the only one who is actually a Christian. The rest all are all our neighbors. All of them are our neighbors. And many of them are top, top people, and, uh, dato, la, professors, la, doctors, la, PhD holders, la, so many of those guys, lawyers. La. And they, did, they said this, you know, it says, they regret that in the, in the 80s and the early 90s, they did not, they did not emphasize a full dawah activities in Sarawak. They regret they, they, they did not do it. But you know what they all want to do, right? For Sarawak. Sabah now is struggling, really struggling. So what I'm saying is prayer is so important to push back all this works of darkness. <clears throat> so as a conclusion, <clears throat> I just put their prayer for ourselves and family, but they pray for all the situation you see around us. Look at Proverbs 4, verse 26 to 27. <clears throat> it says, ponder the path of your feet. That means think through and consider, reflect. Consider the path of your feet. Let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the left or to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil, he says. But I go back to verse 20. This is actually, you take this actually as the, you know, the father speaking to the son, but take it, God is saying to us here, God is saying to us directly here in his words. The father is speaking to the son. God is speaking to us as his children. So take it as God speaking to us. My son, he says, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my saying. Do not let them depart from your eyes. So God's here talking to us about the whole context of his word. Keep them, my word, in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. And then in verse 24, 25. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. And let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelid look right before you. This is what God is saying to us. Guard your ways. Walk according to my word. Keep yourself from evil. Turn away from evil. Walk the path of righteousness. Hold on to my word. Obey them. Follow them. Let my word sink deep in your heart. They are life to those who find them and health to their flesh. Keep your heart. Guard your heart with all diligence. For out of your heart flows all the things that we do in life. It comes from the heart. What we say, what we do. Put away from your mouth deceitful things. Put away from you a deceitful mouth. Put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead, straight ahead and your eyelid looks right before you. Walk right, says God, in me all the days of your life. So just to close here, we are born for such a time as this. So happened for us that we are here in this generation, part of the generation. It's a challenging time. 
like what God says to Esther, you are born at such a time as this. This is our time. Amen. This is our time. We cannot help it. God has established us, put us where we are right now. You are here in your city for a reason. We are there in our place for a reason. <clears throat> I come to the ministry by chance. I was never meant to be a full-time pastor. I don't think so. You know? I'm, not even, I'm not even eloquent. I was very introvert. I used to shy away from the crowd. When I came to the ministry, by chance, I don't know why God called me, but I look back in my life, and many times God saved me from death, very near death. And there must be a very reason why God did that. Even before I really know Him, I really know my calling. God has already saved, preserved my life. Maybe that's the reason why God did that because he wanted me to be in the full-time ministry for some reason or another. I was not supposed to, to, to minister in northern Sarawak. I was, I was from the southern part of Sarawak. I'm a Bedayu, living in Kuching area where all the Bedayu are. Northern Sarawak, the old, the other orang Ulus. Yeah? The Kelabit, the Kayan, the Kenya, the Penan, all the, the Brawan, all the people on that side. They are not my people. We don't speak the same language, but God put me there to be in Miri, to minister to the people in the north. My people are further down in the south. So all of us have different calling. And God called me out into the ministry. The first sign that God actually told me that maybe he wanted me was when I realized that one time I almost, when I was a student, I almost drowned in Australia. Almost drowned. Basically, I was dying in the middle of the sea, coming to it, carried by the sea, by the current. And out of nowhere, the land is so far there, people are all there on the beach. Out of nowhere, out of the middle, further away from the sea, God sent a young man on the surfboard, an angel. Cannot be an, a man, because how can you come from the far side with a surfboard to come and help rescue me? Has to be an angel. Blonde hair, very handsome looking. 16, 17 years old. Very handsome boy, very handsome young man. 16, 17 years old. Came out from nowhere, from the middle of the sea, from the far from the sea in Australia, Bondi Beach. The cross is over there. And then he took, grabbed me, put me on the surfboard, and he paddled me to the beach. When, you, when I got there, I turned around. When the people, the last savers come and pick me up, I turned around. The surfboard was there, not there. The young man was not there, gone. I asked people, where is that person? Nobody knew. None of them knew. The first sign that God seemed to have something that he has you know, calling on my life. So we need to be sensitive to what God's saying to us. Amen. All of us have a calling. We are born for such a time as this. Know your purpose. What way, big way, little way, fulfill it, pursue it. Amen. You know, in my church, there are a few of my members in our MEC church because I'm taking care of several con congregations, overseeing several congregations. Quite a number, few of them actually are actively involved in this very difficult ministry. I'm talking about difficult because this is a, a very sensitive ministry. But they're putting their life on the line, bringing these people, our neighbors, to come to Christ. I know one of them has been, uh, he has been kind of like uh, uh, brought in for interrogations more than 21 times. Almost 30 times, I think now. They took her in for interrogation for hours and hours and grilled her. But she's been doing this ministry for almost 20 years, putting her life on the line under surveillance. There are a few others, him and his family, are on the line. But they brought many of them to Christ. Even when they told me, they said, Hey, Pastor, you know, last time we baptized 130 of them. One go. In the river mouth. From a boat. In the evening. Behind a big boat. Small boat. From the small boat, they jump to the water. Come out, jump water. Come out, into the boat, they jump. In the river mouth, they baptize them quietly. These people are doing things that God wants them to do. But they're putting their lives on the line. They say many. So there's a real urgency for all of us to do what God wants us to do. Firstly, to pray, yeah? to witness, to preach, share the gospel, heal the sick, impact our community. Those of us who have been attending this uh, seminar on healing the sick, use it for God's glory. Bring people to be, sa to, to, to be saved. You heal the sick, but you also bring them to Christ so that they come to know Christ. Amen. Because that's the way for you to bring people to come to Christ. So. And once they come to Christ, then you follow them up until they grow in the Lord. There's a calling for all of us. All of us have works to do that God wants to do. Let us do it with a great sense of urgency. Hallelujah. Amen.
Amen. Hallelujah. So we all stand. I don't know how you end your service here. Do you have music? No. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's just, uh, yeah. If even the musician want to play a close or closing song or so up to you, after this, after this, let's just pray first. Maybe the musician can take your place and we sing one closing song. Hallelujah. But let's just uh, lift up our hands to God. Let's just pray and call upon the name of the Lord. Just ask God, maybe God is, uh, you know, speaking to you about your own uh, uh, your own work and your own ministry that God's calling you into. What is your calling? What does, what does God want you to focus on? Hallelujah. Let's just pray together, shall we? Kuraba shanda raba baba ba kurashidi bara bara gashidi baga shaja. We just pray for yourself. Kia raba shanda raga raba ba kurashidi kashidi du du du. Uraba ba 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 gashidi du 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 du. Kuriya raga shidi baga shanda raga raba ba hara gashidi du 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 shidi du du. Oh God, kara ba 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 ba. Believe up your name, Father. We glorify your name. Oh Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Kia raba shanda gashidi baga raba ba kurudu du 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 du. Lost not by might, not by power, but by Thy Holy Spirit. We are born for such a time as this, Father God, for a divine purpose, Father. All of us, Lord, there's a place in the body of Christ. All of us have a calling in the body of Christ. All of us, Father God. Help us, Lord. Help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to be faithful, Father God. To be faithful what does you want us to do, Father God, Lord. Help us, Lord, to walk the path that you want us to walk, Father God, Lord. Be faithful until the end, Father. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Touch our heart, Father God. Touch us, Father God. Grant us the sense of the agency. Grant us the boldness. Grant us the faith, Father God. In the name of Jesus. Grant us the hunger and thirst. Oh God. Strengthen us in our faith. Oh Holy Spirit, come and touch us right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Feel us with the sense of urgency of God. Your anointing come upon us, Lord. Lord. To love you more and more. Oh God, hunger, desire more and more in our life, Father God. More and more of you, oh God. Less of us. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks, oh God. We give you glory, oh God. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. We praise you. We give thanks to you, Father God, Lord. Oh God, you're going to do great and mighty things for us, Father God. I pray, Lord, bless this church. Bless the members of the church, Father God. Bless all their work in this city. Oh God, bless the work of this church in this city, Father God. Let them touch and impact lives, Lord. Let more people be drawn to your kingdom through the ministry to their life, Father God. Let each everyone, Father God, each member, Father God, know they're calling before you. Know, know what you want them to do for you, Father God. For your glory. Help them to be faithful, to be fervent, Father God, to be diligent in serving you. Bring your will, Father God, for your glory, your God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. We thank you. We praise you. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. We give you glory, your God. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you. We praise you, God. Hallelujah. 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 And come, Holy Spirit, fall on me now. I need your anointing. Come in your power. I love Holy Spirit and come Holy Spirit fall on me now I need your anointing come in your power I love you Holy Spirit you're captivating my soul and every day I grow to love you more
spirit and in truth. I worship you in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Worship you. Hallelujah. Forever. So glory goes to Him. Amen. Amen.